Hello everyone, I'm CJ Werleman. Don't forget to click the subscribe button below and we kindly ask you please help keep our show going and growing by supporting my journalism at patreon.com slash CJ Werleman. Even $1 or $5 is a big help and you'll receive exclusive content and benefits in return. Now let's get into it. Imagine for a moment if the 50 Muslim majority countries united as one, making just one Islamic nation state. Its population would be 1.8 billion people and would have a GDP of $8 trillion, making it the third largest economy behind the United States and China. Obviously, this is a fanciful idea, given the Muslim world comprises a wide range of diverse cultures and ethnicities, along with a significant number of geopolitical rivalries, such as Saudi Arabia versus Iran, Morocco versus Algeria, and the long simmering tensions between Afghanistan and Pakistan. Needless to say, the idea of a singular Islamic state is an unrealistic aspiration. But what I hope for, and what I truly believe to be a realistically attainable goal, is for the Islamic world to unite and speak with a singular and righteous voice against injustices in the Muslim world. Yes, I know there's the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, but this was never set up to resolve injustices against persecuted Muslim communities. This was established only to represent the economic interests of the most powerful Arab monarchies, namely the Saudi, Bahraini, Kuwaiti and Emirati royal families, all of whom are guilty of committing human rights violations against their respective Muslim populations. More to the point, you don't see the OIC speaking out against the genocide of Muslims in India and Kashmir, because its most powerful members earn huge profits dealing with the Indian government. Unless we forget that a half dozen of these Arab states also normalize apartheid Israel in exchange for US weapons. What I'm talking about is a collective Islamic body that speaks clearly, honestly and righteously on human rights abuses in the Muslim world. A body that does not serve a political motive, that is not funded or controlled by nation states, that explains and counters injustices in the Muslim world without hidden agendas. One that can, for instance, speak honestly to the crimes committed against Muslims everywhere, not only those committed by geopolitical rivals and foes. More importantly, this hypothetical Islamic body would help Muslims understand the truth by cutting through the lies and conspiracy theories that are designed by powerful governments to keep the Muslim world confused and divided. Which brings me to the key point of this episode. As a journalist who spent the past 12 years exposing crimes and injustices against Muslim communities throughout the world, I have witnessed and documented a tremendous amount of human suffering. And I would be lying if I said it hasn't exacted at least some kind of psychological toll on my emotional well-being. I've even been hit with criminal charges for accurately reporting injustices against Muslim minorities in India and Kashmir. But I can deal with all that. But what I find unbearable are people who deny and whitewash evidence of ethnic cleansing, genocide and other forms of human rights abuses, particularly when Muslims are the victim and those doing the whitewashing are also Muslim. For instance, there are Muslims who believe that the Uyghur genocide is a CIA-generated hoax meant to embarrass China. There are others who believe Syrian victims of the Assad regime are crisis actors and Saudi government-paid stooges. And there are dozens of similar conspiracies shared about the war in Yemen all of which are meant to undermine solidarity for the innocent victims of powerful nation states. These conspiracies are amplified by state-controlled media outlets, be they American, Russian, Chinese, Iranian or Saudi government operated, each pushing a narrative that advances their respective strategic interests by covering up their respective crimes against humanity. And because an overwhelming majority of global oppression and injustice occurs in the Muslim world, Muslims are not only being divided, but also turned against each other by the propaganda efforts of the American, Russian and Chinese governments. Anyway, that's the bad news. The good news is there's a remedy against their efforts to divide and conquer the Muslim world. The remedy sits within the academic field of international relations. So as a university graduate in counterterrorism global security, I will use the next five minutes to unpack everything you need to know from a four year degree in geopolitics because understanding this will help you see through the lies and propaganda. Okay, the first thing you need to know about the international system is it lacks a global police force or authority to force nation states to play by the rules. We live in what's called a system of anarchy. The international system is characterized by anarchy, where nation states have no higher authority to address disputes. There is no 911 to call. 
This leaves states responsible for their own security and survival. It's a self-help world, meaning each state has to solve problems for itself, sometimes on its own. What this means is every nation state is solely responsible for its own national security. And because no country can ever be 100% certain of the intentions and motives of its neighbors and adversaries, it falls upon each state to accumulate as much military and diplomatic power as possible, therefore making the international system a zero-sum game. This puts every country in a race to accumulate as much power as quickly as possible, creating what's known as a permanent security dilemma. The search for security can lead to what is called the security dilemma, where one state's rational attempt to grow its power or get security for itself makes another feel less secure. That second state may then take steps to protect its own self, but end up worrying the first state in the process. An action-reaction process can set in, leading all to feel, act, and be less secure. Think of a neighbor who starts suddenly patrolling his yard nightly with a shotgun, and how the other neighbors might feel. Put another way, state survival is the number one concern of every national government, which means questions regarding human rights and international law take a distant second place to the accumulation of power. States are encouraged to pursue power and security relentlessly because they live in a self-help international system. Essentially, you know, today's friend could be tomorrow's enemy. And to the extent that that's true, you never know who's going to be aligned against you down the road or who's making plans against you now. So you can never have enough power. Like, how much is enough power? I don't know. You know, who's going to be lined up against me in 10 years? This means every state's behavior can be explained by their rational fear of insecurity. What this means is the United States' motives are no different from China, Russia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, or anybody else. If, let's say, New Zealand was to suddenly become the world's number one military and economic power, it would behave no different than China or the US today. New Zealand would use that might to maintain its status as the world's number one power because every country craves the same power and security, and every country is doing whatever it can to attain more of it. Obviously, this is not the way the world should be, but it will remain the way until there's a fundamental rethinking of the way we imagine nations and borders. But because the international system is this way, it makes governments perceive and imagine security threats everywhere. For instance, the United States invaded Iraq in 2003 because it perceived, or rather imagined, the threat of WMDs immediately after being attacked on 9-11. But because it knew it would have to kill millions of innocent Muslims to mitigate that threat, the US media used Islamophobic propaganda to dehumanize Muslim lives to gather international support for its criminal invasion. Now, propaganda is the key here because every country uses it in the pursuit of more power and security. Now, when we look at China today, we see a clear example of how state manufactured propaganda is being used as a strategy to divide the Muslim world for the purpose of covering up its Muslim genocide. You see, China perceives Uyghur Muslims to be a security threat, not because they're Muslim, but because they are the indigenous inhabitants of Xinjiang, an autonomous zone that sits on China's northwestern border, which is the forefront of President Xi Jinping's multi-trillion dollar one Belt Initiative. Now remember what I said earlier, security is the number one concern of every nation state, which means a primary fixation on securing national borders. And because Uyghurs live on this border, it means from the standpoint of the Chinese government, Uyghurs are perceived to be a potential threat to China's border security. So China is dealing with this imagined threat by flooding the Uyghur homeland with Han Chinese migrants, while detaining upwards of 5 million Uyghurs in a network of concentration camps. We know this because thousands of survivor testimonies alongside troves of leaked official Chinese government documents prove allegations of genocide to be true. The leaked evidence obtained by anonymous hackers drawing swift condemnation from world leaders. Thousands of Uyghurs are pictured in the files, which were taken from the official databases of two local police agencies in the Xinjiang region. That's where China's Communist Party is accused of detaining more than a million members of the Muslim minority group. These revelations have forced China to go into overdrive with its propaganda efforts and has found a trusted ally among the Western left, specifically anti-US imperialists who do not have the foggiest clue for how the international system works. 
these so-called anti-war leftists naively and ignorantly believe the United States to be the sole accumulator of power and the world's unique bad actor. And they wrongly believe that if the United States is vanquished from power, then world peace will be attained, when in reality, America's position as international top dog would only be replaced by another great power, one that potentially has an even greater disregard for human rights. In other words, global peace and security cannot be attained by wishing away the United States, China, Russia, or whomever, because the international system will always encourage insecurity, competition, and militarization, no matter who sits at the top of the tree. But back to my point regarding China. It has funneled tens of millions of dollars to leftist groups and media platforms to sow doubt in the West and Muslim world about the Uyghur genocide. This piece written in New Lines magazine actually tracks the financial part of this story, the money behind some of the denialism that you may have come across. The piece is titled, The Big Business of Uyghur Genocide Denial. A New Lines investigation reveals a network of charities funneling millions into left-wing platforms that take Beijing's side on the genocide allegations and they're all- This money has allegedly been funneled to a network of individuals and platforms, including pro-Palestinian group Code Pink and Grey Zone journalist Vijay Prashad. Both Grey Zone and Code Pink claim the Uyghur genocide to be a fabricated lie in exchange for Chinese money. But the pro-Palestinian group Code Pink is an interesting case study because it illustrates how even seemingly pro-Muslim organizations are being used to divide the Muslim world. For instance, Code Pink champions Palestinian rights while its founders invest heavily in Israeli companies that openly work with Israeli occupation forces, as revealed in this investigation. It's no coincidence then that both Code Pink and Grey Zone also push lies and conspiracy theories on behalf of the Russian government to deny and whitewash evidence of Assad's war crimes in Syria. And they used Islamophobic tropes to falsely accuse Syrian first responders of being members of Al Qaeda. And they falsely claim that Syrian parents gas their own children to make Assad look bad. But in returning to my original point, I really believe that most of the injustice taking place in the Muslim world would suddenly disappear with a Muslim world to unite and speak with a singular and righteous voice. Instead of being divided by propaganda and conspiracy theories that are meant to provide political cover for those who are persecuting and oppressing Muslim communities. But you now have the tools to cut through these lies. Anyway, that's my time for today. Please don't forget to subscribe to this channel and we kindly ask you please support this endeavor by becoming a member of this show at patreon.com slash CJ We can't produce, sustain and grow this show without your help and we offer exclusive benefits to those who do. But for now, good night, good morning, wherever you are and stay blessed.